Many people struggle with the Bible. They know the Bible is valuable, they know it's important, but they're not sure where to start, they get stuck somewhere in the middle, and as a result, they end up missing out on the life-changing power of God's Word. And Scripture is full of all kinds of stories that tell this one story. God is a rescuer. God is a redeemer. God is a provider. God is a deliverer. Anybody feeling comfortable this morning? Do you, you feel good where you're at this morning? Wow, this is really not a good start, people. Do we feel good about where we're at this morning? Thank you. That's more what I was looking for. Even if you're lying, that made me feel a whole lot better. I'm glad that you're comfortable this morning. I truly am. I wanted to feel a little bit of what you're feeling, so I thought I'd bring up a nice comfy chair up here this morning and just do this. But in reality, I can't sit still when I speak at all. So I, I can't do that for very long. Um, my name is Justin Brown. I'm the high school youth pastor here. I am not Mike Fackler. I am not the lead pastor here. If you are new here, um, I just wanted you to know that right up front. He's about a foot taller than me, 10 to 30 years older than I am, somewhere in there. I don't know. Um, but I will tell you this, and I haven't said this at every service, and he didn't tell me I had to say this. We are very blessed to have a pastor like we have. He is one of the most encouraging people that I've ever met. And it would be, it would be awesome if you told him that. Because sometimes as a pastor, you don't always hear the encouraging words. So make sure you take some time and you just let him know that and you build him up. Um, we have been going through... Pastor Mike has been taking us through a series called The Good Book over the last three weeks. If you're in community groups, you've been doing these there as well, where you've been going through Darren Spoo's book that looks at uh, 40 of the, or that looks at some of the major themes of Scripture, looking at 40 chapters of the Bible. And so as we've been going through this service, we or going through this series, we looked at the first week that God was there in the beginning and God created everything. He was there, he created us, he created the things that we see. And the second week, Pastor Mike took us through and we looked at how God is good even when life is messy. And don't we all know that life brings some serious messes that we have to work our way through. And God is good even in the midst of those. And last week, he looked at how God is big. He is bigger than our problems. He is bigger than the good things. He is bigger than everything that we could imagine. God is big, and he can handle the things that we're going through. This morning, um, as Pastor Mike, as he asked me a while back if I would speak this morning, I began to look at what the topic was going to be as I was looking through the book. And I looked through that, and I saw that he got that God created everything, that God is good when life is messy, that God is big, and then I got this morning's topic, and I'm not going to tell you what it is yet, but I'm going to tell you it's a little bit less exciting to read about, but it's full of truth. So I'm excited about that part, but it's a little bit painful at times. So get ready. I wanted to make sure you were comfortable this morning because I'm about to try and make you really, really uncomfortable this morning. Um, just so you know, I have a few things when I speak that I would love it if you would do. That if I ask a yes or no question, it would be awesome if you would actually raise your hand if your answer is yes. If you nod your head, I don't get to see you because there's a lot of people in a lot of area to cover. So if you would put your hand up, that would be incredible. So can we do that this morning? Can you put your hand up if your answer is yes? Okay, some of you aren't going to participate. That's okay. If, if I'm speaking this morning and you're sitting there and you're just thinking, mmm that is some good preaching, then I would love it if you would say, mm, that is some good preaching, and just say that out loud. Like, head, head nods are cool, but, but verbal is even better. And if you're sitting there and you're going, uh, mm, I don't know about this, there are some comment cards on the seat back in front of you that you can silently write those things on there. And hopefully I will never have to read them. But... I'm kidding. I would read them if you wrote them. And you can even verbally disagree with me this morning. I am okay with that. Because this morning, like I said, 
we've got something tough that we're going to tackle. But I want to start us off with a promise out of John chapter 16 and verse 33. And if you want, if you have your Bible with you this morning, you can go ahead and open that up to John 15 and 16. We're going to camp out there all morning long. So you can stick your finger in there. You can just open it, put it on your lap, whatever. But in John 16, 33, Jesus is talking to his followers and he says these words. He gives them a promise. He says, take heart. For I have overcome the world. Take heart for I, thank you, first amen, yes. Take heart for I have overcome the world. Now if Jesus had to say that, this is where it gets fun. If Jesus had to say that, then that means he said something a lot more difficult before that. And we're going to look at that this morning. Our theme for this morning, our fourth big idea that we look through when we look at Scripture is that following God requires that we have tough love in troubled times. We have tough love in troubled times. I don't know what image that puts in your head, but in my head, I immediately think of my father when I think of tough love. Like, I think of the dad who I knew loved me even in the times where I might have accused him of not loving me. And even in the times where I was the stubborn high school kid who wouldn't say it back to him if he said it to me, I knew that my dad loved me, but my dad was not afraid to make me do things that I didn't want to do and to not let me do things that I did want to do. And he was, he was bold in those. He had reasons behind them, even if I didn't agree with him. My sophomore year of high school, I had the opportunity to go to the prom that year because I was dating a junior in high school. And my dad's rule was on a Saturday night, 10 o'clock was our curfew because for some really weird reason, he thought that we should be awake when we come into church. And so we would have to be home by 10 o'clock on Saturdays, but he extended it that night and he said I could stay out until midnight. Which was great, except that we had this thing after our prom growing up that we called Project Prom. That would be this party that would go on at the school, so it was a nice, safe place. There wasn't all the, 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 you know, the bad party stuff going on, any of that kind of stuff. But it would go till about 5 a.m., which meant that everybody who went to the Project Prom was not sitting in church in the morning. And that was not okay with my dad. And we had a knockdown, drag it out argument over this thing. I said things that probably a high school student should not ever say to their parents. And I got in some serious trouble for it. And the curfew remained at midnight. Nothing changed. No matter how much I argued this thing, nothing changed. I got home at 12.15. I stuck it to him, <laughs> and I paid for it. We had a, a rule or a, a law that when you were 14 or 15, you could get your, your uh, learner's permit, your farm permit, whatever you wanted to call it out there, which meant that you could drive to and from school, and you could drive to and from work. A lot of my friends, and as a high school student, I sat there and said, all of my friends are driving wherever they want because their parents don't care and they think this law is silly. And so I had that argument with my parents and I remember standing in the foyer of the church knowing full well that my dad was standing right behind me and I'm talking to my friends and they're talking about how they got to drive here and they got to drive there and with as much smart Alex sarcasm as I could possibly muster, I said the words, yeah, my parents will let me drive anywhere I want to as long as it's convenient for them. I paid for my own car. Like, I bought my own car with my own money. I paid for my own gas. I paid for my own insurance. My name was on the title. My dad took my keys away for a month. <laughs> because he believed that honoring your father and mother was important. My dad, yes, absolutely. My dad was tough. And he had tough love because he knew what was good for me. Now, he wasn't perfect by any means. And he didn't always make the right decisions. Hopefully he's not watching this. But he, he didn't always make the right decisions, but he stuck to what he believed in. And we could, we could talk to him about it. We could argue with him about it. Occasionally we might get him to change his mind if we had a really good reason that was better than his, which probably happened like 1% of the time. But he was tough. And now that I'm a dad... I understand that tough love has two sides to it. 
Like there's the side of tough love that, that you have to do something that somebody's not going to like. And you have to say something that they're not going to like because you know that it's the best thing for them. But tough love also means that you have to be tough. Because the, the feedback you're going to get is not going to be pleasant feedback. It, they're going to come at you and it's going to hurt. And I said some hurtful things to my father when I was growing up. I remember a foot washing service where my dad washed my feet. And at the end you always get up and you hug the person who washed your feet and all this. And he, he got up and he gave me this hug and he told me that he loved me. And I refused to say it back to him in that moment. Because I was so upset with the things that he wouldn't let me do and the things that he made me do. That took some toughness from my dad because it would have been a lot easier at that point to say, okay, I've got I've to start letting this kid do whatever he wants. And he wasn't controlling by any means, but he wanted to raise me in a way that would be best for me. Now that I'm a dad, I understand that a whole lot more because my daughters are constantly like 20 times a day. Can I have some candy? Can I have some candy? Can I have some candy? And every, over and over I have to say, no, 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 still no. You ask me again, it's no for the next week. You know what I'm talking about if you're a parent. And the rest of you who aren't parents, you were kids once, so really you still know what I'm talking about. We run into this with our families. We run into this at our jobs. Maybe you're going through something in your job or have gone through something in your job where they have asked you to do something that went against your faith and you had to choose at that moment, am I going to stand firm in my faith in the teachings of Jesus knowing full well that I might not get that bonus, I might not get that raise, I might get fired over this thing. I have to choose if I'm going to compromise my faith or if I'm going to stand firm and possibly lose a job over this thing. We run into this with sports, we run into this with school, we run into it everywhere we go, that we have to make tough decisions, and we have to be tough when the circumstances, when they, the, the consequences come back to us. Is anybody still feeling comfortable this morning? Okay, it's good. We still have a few people that are comfortable. I'm working on you. John chapter 15, we're going to start in verse 18 this morning. So we looked at the promise that Jesus gave us. We looked at how he told us, fear not, for I have overcome the world. That's great. Remember that as we go through the rest of this morning. Remember that he has made that promise to us. Because in John 15, verse 18, he says, if the world hates you, remember that it hated me first. The world would love you as one of its own if you belong to it. But you are no longer part of the world. I chose you to come out of the world. So it hates you. I have to admit, when I started preparing for this message, this is not the passage that went along with, the, with Darren Spoo's book. This is the one that I thought of at first. And all I thought of was just one line out of the scripture. And then I started reading the rest of it. And I was kind of like, I don't, I don't know if I actually still want to use this passage. Like, I'd rather use something a lot more encouraging this morning because this is going to kick me as I'm speaking this thing. This is going to be uncomfortable for me. See, we don't live as part of the world, as one of the world. Yes, we are in the world, but we do not live like the world if we are followers of Christ. I mean, we have to stop and we have to look at our lives. Where is the difference in my life? Is the difference in my life that I go to church on the weekends, but nothing else changes the rest of the week? Am I comfortable in my faith? Because Jesus tells us that following him and having faith in him is anything but comfortable. Do you remember what I told you? A slave is not greater than the master. Since they persecuted me, naturally they will persecute you. And if they had listened to me, they would listen to you. Not since they listened to me, if they would have listened to me, they would listen to you, but they didn't listen to me, so they won't listen to you. How many of you ever feel like the voice of the Christ followers is not listened to? 
that, that government decisions are not listening to the voice of the Christ follower, and we get frustrated and we get angry and we're surprised by it. But in reality, Jesus told us that it was going to happen, that we were going to be ignored, that we were going to be persecuted, that we were going to be hated. They will do all this to you because of me, for they have rejected the one who sent me. They would not be guilty if I had not come and spoken to them. But now they have no excuse for their sin. I have exposed them. I have told them about the things that they need to do differently. And in Galatians, we read from the Apostle Paul that we are supposed to be imitators. Sorry, in Ephesians, we are supposed to be imitators of Christ. Meaning we are supposed to be speaking up knowing we will get ignored. Anyone who hates me also hates my father. If I hadn't done such miraculous signs among them that no one else could do, they wouldn't be guilty. But as it is, they have seen everything I did, yet they still hate me and my father. This fulfills what is written in their scriptures. They hated me without cause. But I will send you the advocate, the spirit of truth. He will come to you from the Father and will testify all about me. He tells us, hey, I'm going to give you some help on this. This is going to be hard. I'm going to give you some help. Don't worry. But you must also testify about me because you have been with me from the beginning of my ministry. We live in a world where testifying about Christ, and really they lived it back then too, testifying about Christ is not popular. And when I say testify about Christ, I'm not talking about going to the street corner and standing on a box and screaming at people and telling them that they're going to go to hell if they don't change what they're doing. I'm not talking about that kind of testifying. I'm talking about the people in your circle of influence who you see that aren't doing what they should be doing, that aren't following Christ, that you speak up and you actually say something in love and you let them hear it knowing full well they're probably going to ignore you. And they might hate you. I speak to high schoolers almost every week knowing full well that half of them aren't listening even as the words are coming out of my mouth. I speak to adults every now and then knowing full well that half aren't listening to the words even as they come out of my mouth. Okay, I just, I made up that statistic, but... See, if you look at the people in Scripture and you look at the lives that they lived, when they chose to follow God, they found out that they had to be tough in troubled times. Starting way back in the beginning of Scripture, we're going to go back to Moses. When you look at Moses, Moses was called by God to do God's will to lead the Israelites out of Egyptian slavery. And for that, he was hated by the Egyptians obviously, and he was hated by the Israelites too. He was hated by the people that he was trying to help and free from slavery because he didn't do it the way that they would have done it and because their life got harder before it got easier and they hated him for it. You look at some people that you're going to look at in your community groups this week when you're going through the good book and you look at these three men who if you watched VeggieTales growing up, you would know them as Rack, Shack, and Benny. But if you look in the scripture, we see them as Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And because they did the will of their father, They were thrown into a furnace. They refused to worship the king of the time. You'll look at another guy by the name of Daniel who refused to stop praying in front of his window to the one true God. And because of that, he was thrown into a lion's den for it. You get up into the New Testament and you get up into the time of Jesus and you begin to see men who followed him. He had 12 disciples that we talk a lot about. He actually had more than that, but he had 12 that we talk a lot about. Of those 12, 10 of them were killed because of their faith, because they refused to be quiet when the people around them told them, stop talking about this. Ten of them were killed for it. The other two, one of them took his life because he betrayed Christ and he couldn't deal with the guilt of it. The other one was exiled to an island for the rest of his life. And I'm not talking like exiled to an island like Hawaii where it's awesome. But I'm talking exiled to a miserable place to live. That is not a glorious way to end your life as a follower of Christ. You look at Christ's own cousin, John the Baptist, who because he would not stop talking about Christ, he ended up being beheaded by the king. And you look at Paul, who we did a series on not too long ago, a guy that we look at and we see that this man wrote most of the New Testament or half of the New Testament. You look at this, and his life ended on the chopping block as well because these men would not stop talking about Jesus. And they would not back down and they would not compromise when the world around them was teaching something completely different 
They said, we won't do it. I have a book upstairs on the table in my office called Jesus Freaks. It was written after DC Talk did their really big song, Jesus Freaks, so it makes a lot of sense why they would call it that. But it's about martyrs, and it's about that thick. And it's story after story after story of men and women and children who would not compromise their faith, knowing full well that what was coming was not going to be a good, pleasant thing. Ileana, or Elena Ilyasova grew up in Russia in the 1960s, and she was being forced to take the pioneer oath in the Communist Party. And she told her teacher, I cannot do this. This goes against my faith, to the point that the teacher had somebody else take the oath for her. But yet she still refused, I will not follow this. Twelve years old, taking a stand. Or the church in Peru in the 1990s that had their church burned down. And then all of their homes of the people who attended the church burned down. And yet they refused to stop testifying about Christ. And then we come to America. And it's not everybody. But we come to church on the weekends and we sit in a comfortable chair where we have air conditioning and heat. And I know we all have different temperatures of our blood. And for some of us, it's too hot. And for some of us, it's too cold. And, and the songs might not be exactly what we want, but the person next to us absolutely loves them. And, and the speaker might not have said what we wanted, but the person next to us absolutely loves it. So we come in here on the weekends and we worship together. And then we leave the doors and nothing is different. People would look at us and say, what's different about you? We're comfortable, weekend Christians. And I'm not saying this is everybody. Don't get me wrong. But I think we probably all have a little bit of this inside of us. I know I do. I know there have been countless times where I knew that I needed to say something, but it was going to cost me part of my reputation. My daughter this week on Friday in her school, they had superhero day, and they could dress up as any superhero they wanted. And my oldest daughter, Keely, seven years old, first grade, she told us that she wanted to dress up as Queen Esther from the Bible. To which, honestly, my very first thought as her dad is, you're going to be the weird kid. <laughs> like, not like I was ashamed of her, and not that I was going to think she was the weird kid, but her friends were going to think she was the weird kid. And my second thought was, some people in that school are going to think we put her up to this. So I, was, I thought about me, I thought about her reputation, and then I realized, no, this is an absolutely awesome opportunity for her to talk about her faith in school. And she did, and she dressed up as Queen Esther, and she got to stand up in front of her class, and she got to say, this is who Queen Esther was. This is why I chose Queen Esther. She was used by God to free the Jews, and she got to talk about this, and it was awesome. I didn't get to see it, but it was awesome as a father to hear that my daughter didn't have the same fears that I have. I'm a pastor for crying out loud. And she had more boldness and courage than I did this week. I will take that. It's not because of me, but I will take that. Lecrae, who is a, a rap uh, art, Christian rap artist, wrote a song a while back called Go Hard. And I realized as I was listening to this during my run yesterday um, that, one, it says go hard or go home for the first 47 seconds of this song. Like, it's just over and over and over again, go hard or go home, go hard. I'm like, wow, that wasn't very creative. But... Then, as I was continuing to listen, as I was running and trying to catch my breath and all of that, I realized what the lyrics in the middle of the song were saying. Now, I'm not going to rap this. I am all for, like, going over to the piano and playing a song and singing and all that kind of stuff. But rap, it's not my thing. So that's one thing. And number two, this is rap music, so the grammar is horrendous. So if you are an English major or anything like that, please just give us some leeway on this one. But Lecrae writes these words in the middle of this song. I went to Asia, had to duck and hide for sharing my faith. He went to a place where it was not safe, but he did it anyway. They tell me, water it down when I get back to the States. 
They say, tone the music down. You might sell a lot of records, but it's people out here dying, and none of them heard the message. Took my wifey on, and I love that he calls her wifey, because that's what Sarah is called in my phone. Took my wifey on mission trip in Central America. Shared her testimony. Forty people stood and stared at her. When she said Jesus should have seen, it was insane, because 40 out of 40 never heard of Jesus' name. Oh, man. I really want to wrap this, but it's so bad I can't do it. <laughs> oh, man, we ain't focused on the war. And he's talking about us. We ain't focused on the war. We just kicking it. We're just sitting back and relaxing while there's a war going on around us. Worried about our image and our space up on the Internet. Worried about what people are going to think about us. Worried about my social media posts and what I'll get back. Take me out of the game, coach. I don't want to play no mo. If can't give it all, I got. If I can't give it all, I got, and leave it out there on the court. Thank you for the grace, for the will, and the desire. Got me living for your glory, instead of living to retire. God, I'm living for you. I'm not just living to have a nice, comfy retirement. I'm living for you, God. But I pray I'll never tire of going hard for the Messiah. I don't need no motivation. You the reason. I'm inspired. Go hard or go home. Lord, use me. Even in rap, there are some good messages that we can get. I'm seeing some younger students out here like, finally, somebody used rap in the church. This is awesome. Go hard or go home. It sounds like such a simple message, but in sports, we talk a lot about how there's no pain or no gain. In our faith, we just say, no pain, no pain, no pain. Jesus didn't leave us alone. I want to leave you with encouragement. Jesus did not leave us alone. You're following along in your notes. I've got three things in there, and these are not an exhaustive list, and I don't have time to tell you everything that I would like to tell you about them. But number one is that we have got, if we're going to be, have tough love in troubled times, we have got to lean into the people who are around us. God puts people in our lives for a reason. We've got to lean into them. My, some of my favorite movies of all time are the Rocky movies, minus Rocky V. But some of my favorite movies of all time are these movies. And I realized as I was watching these when I was younger that Rocky always gets behind on his training. And he's always about to fail and he's about to lose. And he can't get back up. And he doesn't have the motivation that he needs until Adrian supports him. Adrian, his wife, for those of you who don't watch Rocky. You should, but for those of you who don't watch it, until somebody came beside him, the right person came beside him, he didn't have the strength that he needed. We are created for community. We push community here. We push community groups, a group of people that you can get in with, that you can have hold you up when you need to be held up because life is hard. A group of people who will push you and show you tough love when you're the one who needs to hear it. And some of us need to deliver some of that tough love. Don't forget about the love part. Be tough with love. Lean into community. We need to lean into scripture. See, so many times we talk about my faith is based on this, but we don't actually know what this says. So it's really easy then for Satan to do what he tried to do to Jesus in the desert and to use scripture and to manipulate it and try to convince us that something is true that is absolutely not true. When Jesus encountered a woman who had been caught in adultery and people were pulling her out and they were getting ready to stone her to death because that's what the law said that they could do, Jesus told them, those of you who have never sinned, you cast the first stone. You start killing this lady. That's okay. Go for it. None of them could do it because they had all messed up. See, the world, Satan, will take that and he will tell us, See, Jesus told us not to judge anybody, and Jesus told us not to call people out, and Jesus told us that people can do what they want. People can be who they want to be, be whatever they wanted to be. God created them this way. But in reality, Jesus ended that story by looking at that woman and saying, go and sin no more. I'm not going to judge you for this. I'm not going to kill you for this. But 
I'm also not going to sit by and just let you continue in this without at least speaking and saying something. I have two awesome little girls and a little boy who can't do anything yet, but I have two awesome little girls who like to play in the street in our cul-de-sac. And when a car comes by in the cul-de-sac and they don't see it because sometimes they're not paying attention, I don't just very quietly say out of the window, hey, girls, if you would like to, there's a vehicle coming and you should probably move. I open the door and I say, girls, car! And they move. I love them when I say that. And then they listen. Sometimes I tell them things and they don't. And we're going to have people that won't. But if we have this as our basis and we follow the words that are in this and we lean into this, then we don't have to stress about when they won't listen. And finally, we lean into Jesus. We make sure that the people that we are leaning into, our community, we make sure that they're leaning into scripture and that they're leaning into Jesus so that they're not giving us bad advice. But then we also lean into Jesus. When Jesus followed the will of God, and this is the story I didn't talk about. When Jesus followed the will of God, it took him to a cross. It didn't take him, eventually, yes, it took him to glory. But first, it took him to a cross where he would be tortured and murdered and ridiculed. He didn't want to go. So often I think as Christians we think, well, he wanted to do that because he was doing that for me. No, he didn't want to go to it. He wanted to do what his father asked him to do. But in the garden he was pleading with his father, please don't make me do this. But he was tough in that moment and he followed through with what God's will was for his life. The world hated me, it will hate you also. But in John 16, 33, to read the rest of that verse, he said to his followers, I have told you all this so that you may have peace in me Here on earth you will have many trials and sorrows, but take heart, for I have overcome the world. This morning we're going to finish with communion. We're going to invite you, if you are a follower of Christ, to participate in this. You will go out the left side of your aisle. You'll come up here, you'll grab the elements, or you can go to the back. Come back down the right side of your aisle. But as you take this, understand that we are remembering Jesus' death at this moment. We are remembering that he did not give up even when things got hard. That he said, We're, I'm gonna go hard or I'm gonna go home. And he's inviting us in 1 Corinthians chapter six, the writer Paul writes that as you take of communion, you are proclaiming my death to the world around you. Jesus has overcome the world and he has won the war, but we are still in the battle. And when you take of communion, it better not stop here. It better not stop here. I don't know that any of you are gonna say this when this morning is over, but if you come up to me and say, good message, pastor, which happens, Sometimes, I get that every now and then. If you're going to say that, do not leave these doors and have nothing change in your life. Do not leave these doors and simply go out and live on by the worldly lifestyle. Be bold, be tough. Would you pray with me? God, thank you for the example that you set, that you didn't ask us to do something that you wouldn't do yourself But instead you told us they're going to hate you because they hated me. They're going to persecute you because they persecuted me. You went through it all first. And Lord, we praise you for that this morning. Amen.